Ultrasounds can be wonderful and positive and all the good things. They can also be stressful and negative, (laughs) depending on what the situation is. I think it's just important that we all have an opportunity to decide for ourselves if this is something that we want. And I think because it's so routine, we haven't had an opportunity to do that. Getting pregnant and giving birth are two of the most exciting things you can ever hope to experience in this life. The moment you think you could be pregnant, you're frantically searching for all the best information, which is why you're here today. I'm Stephanie King, and with my many years of experience as a professional childbirth educator, doula, and lover of all things pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, I'm here to make preparing for your birth enjoyable, empowering, and totally easy. Each week, I'll cover different topics, interview professionals, and get into the nitty-gritty birth stories from mamas just like you. And when you're ready for more, you can join me in the My Essential Birth course at myessentialbirth.com, where I take you step-by-step through exactly how to prepare your mind, body, spirit, and partner for a birth you love. So let's get started. This week's episode comes to us from some questions that we get on social media and an email all about is ultrasound safe. And I actually love this question. It is something that I researched myself, especially with my first and on and on and on as I learned more and more about childbirth and became more curious about all of the options available for moms being myself at the time. And then into my childbirth education and doula work, this is something that I too have questioned and just want to know a little bit more about. So I love that we're getting these questions and it gives us an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper. So oftentimes, the reason that we get this question is mom is put in some kind of high risk category and she's seeking information on if the amount of ultrasounds that she is being requested to have is safe or even necessary. And I think that's totally valid. When something is done so routine like ultrasound, and I mean routine to the point that about 100% of women get ultrasounds, even if it's just one during their pregnancy at this point. It kind of stalls us from asking or thinking, is there anything wrong with it? And I'm not here to tell you yes or no, but I am here to give you information so that you can maybe have a little bit, maybe it piques your interest a little so that you can go and find some information on your own. I'll give you what I have here. I won't dive too deep. This is going to be one of our quicker episodes. I do want to give you the information that I have and then encourage you to go out and look for more. Even ask your providers. I'd be so curious to see what different providers are saying. The truth is, I don't know how much information they're given about it other than it looks pretty safe. And that's kind of what's trailing down. So let's get into that today. So ultrasounds, as I said, they're probably one of the most recognized form of care during pregnancy, and they're widely considered safe for mom and baby, which is why seriously, like all providers use them at this point. But as we know, and you guys, (laughs) this is kind of my thing, right? Everything that we do has an effect for good or for bad, for big or for small. And everything that we do, there can be risks and benefits to each one. So we know, for example, that some of the risks that come along with ultrasound include things like moving a due date or increasing induction rates or things like that. So that is, for example, a risk having nothing to do with some other things I'm going to talk about that could come along with ultrasound. Some benefits could be catching things a little bit earlier. For example, a placenta previa, which is when your placenta covers your cervix, which could be a little scary if that goes on and on. However, I'm going to talk about the other side of that too, which is what would happen if they never saw it in the first place. So there are benefits and risks either way, but I want to dive into the information today, at least what I have, not that it's perfect, because it's definitely something that piqued my interest. Now, most moms are probably going to get two ultrasounds during pregnancy, maybe three. The most common ones happen in that very first trimester when they are trying to date a pregnancy. It doesn't always happen, but it is very common and definitely on the routine schedule of things. Remember that we tell you that this can happen anywhere between 8 and 12 weeks, but we always say if they're using it for dating, 11 to 13 weeks is the most uh, accurate as far as evidence goes to tell you when your baby will be due, the closest to that 40-week guest date that we all talk about. The next one usually happens around 20 weeks gestation. That's the one that they call the anatomy scan. And that's where typically, like now we have blood tests that tell us, boy or girl, but typically where you would find out the sex of your baby should you want to know. 
And even those can be wrong, as we know. But that's also where they measure the weight of the baby, the length of the baby, the the width, <laughs> the measurements for the head. <laughs> like, how big is your baby's head? The measurements for the head. And they're looking at organs and blood flow and the abdomen measurements and anything that could give them a little bit of an indication, even your placenta and stuff, that, that things look good or that there might be something abnormal there. Now, do you need this? I don't know. Maybe let's talk about that in a little bit. But it is definitely part of that routine scan. This is also where they might may or may not see things like issues for Down syndrome or other anomalies that can come up that may or may not need a little bit more testing or information. They can catch stuff in the brain and the heart and, and all kinds of things, right? So very routine, very common, that 20-week ultrasound scan. If you get nothing else, that's probably the one that you would get. Now, sometimes we have that third trimester scan. There can be different reasons for that. It could be positioning of the baby. It could be more scans because they caught something on the 20-week scan that warrants some more looking into in that third trimester. And that could be all different kinds of things. But for example, we'll say placenta previa where we have the placenta covering the cervix. Maybe they want a later trimester scan to make sure that it has moved up and out of the way. Or if it hasn't, that how far it is covering the cervix. And if we need to talk cesarean section or something like that as, as time goes on. The other reason that we see it is maybe your fundal height is measuring big or it's measuring small. And so they're concerned about the size of the baby and they want to get in there and take a look, make sure that things are going well. Another reason for a late term one is you are wanting to not have an induction and you pass that 40 week due date and your provider requests an ultrasound and or an NST being a non-stress test. And that can be another reason that mom and baby are scanned. So there's many different places that you can end up having an ultrasound and there are different reasons for it. Does it mean that they are necessary? Does it mean that you can say yes or no? So I'm going to talk about some things and then we'll get to that in the end. Now, if you're high risk, you're probably going to be offered a lot more and especially in the later months or weeks of your pregnancy. Obviously, that's going to depend on the reason that you have been categorized as high risk and what they want to look at and what whatever they're looking at, what their normal concern is for it. Is it something that it's really not going to be an issue until we're really close to, to giving birth or is it something that we really have to keep an eye on every week? That will be up to you and your provider and whatever the situation might be. But those are some of the reasons that you will have more ultrasounds. While an ultrasound is not the same as an x-ray, it is a form of energy known as non-ionizing radiation and it can affect biological tissues. So one thing that I want to go over today, and I'm going to put a link in the show notes for this. I think it's super interesting. I'll probably even send it out in the email this week, just if you're curious. So this is a video that I came upon when I was getting curious about ultrasound myself, particularly with my first baby. Just wondering, I remember thinking, is this necessary? And and knowing that every single thing that I did had an effect, it just kind of like popped in my head, like, why are we doing Like, is it, do we really need it for everybody? Anyways, so this video was actually... Uh, an interview that was done. It was CNN in 1993. And they interviewed a couple of scientists and doctors about some research that they were doing. And they were stating some of their concerns that they had in regards to ultrasound and the effects that it had on cells and on babies. There's actually another study that I really dove deep into. I remember it was it had many pages. It was a Canadian study I do not remember what year it was. And they talked about the left-handedness rate and the low birth weight that they had studied and found that babies who had more ultrasounds experienced both of those things, which in and of themselves, you're like, is it really that big of a deal? And it's not to say it is or isn't. It's just to say it clearly had an effect. And we, since we don't know exactly what that effect is in the way of, you know, we don't see deformed babies and things like that. What is the effect? It was just kind of like, hey, it's not that it's not doing nothing. Now, I have reached out to several midwives at this point. I have asked for people to help me find this study because I read it several times and it used to come up with a quick Google search. So shame on me for not grabbing that off the internet while I had the chance. But if you are listening and you are a doula or midwife or nurse or mom who has seen this, please send it to me and I will include it in the show notes with this and I will shoot it out in the email as well. But that was a really interesting study. And other studies have come since then. In my opinion, they haven't been done as in depth and 
anyways, I, I they have showed some of the same kind of things on a on a lower scale, but I do think that is something to be noted. Just it would be a really great study to read again. This video, however, uh, I want to dive into some of the things that it talks about, and it's definitely an older video, so you guys are gonna have to enjoy and appreciate the time era of when it came. But at the end of it, it says, you know, for more information, see the Journal of Nurse Midwifery, July. August edition of 1984. So this is stuff that they've been researching or at the time were researching, you know, for a little bit, maybe about 10 years before they did this. So anyways, within this video, they talk about their, the, the concerns would be genetic damage, cancer, and subtle birth defects that might not show up for years. So as I said, obviously things like missing organs and missing limbs or, you know, things like that, they're not seeing any of that kind of stuff, mental retardation, we're not seeing the effects from ultrasound of that. And so that's a positive thing. However, there might be more subtle things that we're not seeing. And so that's kind of what it it goes into a little bit. It also mentioned the providers in that and the scientists in this particular video were saying, you know, if we should, if we can, we probably should avoid routine ultrasounds. And we've heard from different providers, even, you know, Dr. Stu that I had on here not too long ago, he was of the same thing. And it wasn't necessarily because of the safety of ultrasound so much as it was once we start catching things, quote unquote, on the ultrasound and moving due dates and that kind of thing, that that, that can definitely be something that it would be a negative side effect of this. But what they found is that the unborn fetuses that were exposed to ultrasound did weigh less at birth and they weren't finding those blatant deformities, but in animal and human cells that were exposed to the ultrasound waves. Now, these are cells, so animal and human cells that were exposed to the ultrasound waves, and they show this in the video. They found abnormal changes in the ways that the cells looked and behaved. So this woman was saying she's not going to say that the cells look genetically damaged. However, she does say that the damage that is occurring looks the same as the damage that is caused to cells by 29 rads of ionizing radiation or x-rays, which was the equivalent of about 250 chest x-rays. So that is direct ultrasound to the cells and what that looked like as far as damage goes. And damage, you know, also being the behavior. So normal cells, it showed this, that normal cells what they looked like without ultrasound. They were growing apart from each other in neat rows. You could see it under a microscope and they were showing the cells and they were, you know, well formed and all of that. And then after the ultrasound, they were in a tangled, just growing wildly all over each other, kind of in this tangled mass, as they said. And it really did look like just these jaggedy, just, you know, lines all over the place versus being this more like round in a neat row cell. And then it showed normal cells in motion. It had a video and it, it showed that the cells move in a clear direction and they have smooth edges. And then after they were exposed to ultrasound, 100% of them became phonetic and distorted. And they were, so they were just moving around randomly, no place to go, uh, looked I mean, if a cell could look confused, it looked very confused or like it was on drugs, I guess would be like the best way of showing it. Just the like, it was kind of like shaking and in and out of itself and and no clear direction. So that was really interesting. The other thing that they found was that the effects showed for longer than 10 generations from what she had studied. And the point that they were trying to make too, and that, I mean, it immediately piqued my interest because I thought it before they even said it, is I'm like, baby girls have all of their eggs in their bodies when they are born for the babies that they are going to have for the rest of their lives. And so especially when we are exposing babies, um, particularly baby girls, but obviously there would be effects on boy and girl. But when you're exposing baby girl, especially towards those last weeks of pregnancy, when all of her eggs are uh, getting ready to be born with her, then we have to think about what were the implications of that for future generations as well, which I thought was interesting. Now, you have to remember, too, like the time that this was done in 1993, When the doctor was asked, you know, about how many people would you say are getting ultrasound, he's like 50%. And that was back then. So you heard me at the beginning of this episode. We know that it's really close to 100%. Like we're in the 90 something percent for sure for the amount of people that are getting ultrasounds. Now, this may be different depending on on your provider. Um, Really, though, I would say that'd be, I can't say that totally. I would say the majority of the women that are getting ultrasounds routinely you know, one to three during their pregnancy are going to be in a hospital setting, whether that's with a midwife or an OB. 
However, it's not that that doesn't happen outside of the hospital and it and even out of hospital home births or birth center births. One to three, I would say, would probably be standard as well. So it really, you might see less of that with a different provider. And that would, it's something that you get to choose, which I want to talk about too. But that's something to discuss with your provider as well. I think it's something we just don't talk about really right now. So really quick before I get into your options and being able to say yes and no, because with everything we get to say yes and no, I do want to talk about ultrasound in general. So when we say ultrasound, it's, of course, you're all thinking of like the ultrasound scan where we are looking at the baby from outside of the belly. We're looking inside. There is also the DOP tone and the electronic phenol monitor. Now, all three of those, the ultrasound scan, the Doptone, and the phenol monitor, all have that non-ionizing radiation. Uh, Dopplers can be used during pregnancy and also during labor. So maybe you go to one of your appointments and they want to listen to the heartbeat of the baby and they use the little machine uh, and they have to put a little bit of that gel on it. Anything that needs gel is going to help conduct. And so that's what it's conducting so that it can hear or see. So when you use the Doptone, that's they're putting the gel on and they're listening to baby. That is a form of ultrasound. And then when you've got the electronic fetal monitors, same thing. So, and that can be used for many hours during labor, as we know. And it can also be used for your non-stress tests before labor and, and all kinds of things. So those are just so that you guys are aware. It's not just when we're taking a look at the baby. Those are other things that may have an effect if we're using them. Now, can you say yes or no? <laughs> Obviously, with anything, you get the option to say yes or no. I mean, maybe we think about saying no to this, or maybe we just don't think of it at all. It's just part of the routine. Like, okay, it's just like before you knew that you could say no to vaginal exams. It's like, okay, well, let's do a vaginal exam and, you know, not are you okay if I check you, but let's do a vaginal exam and go ahead and get your blood pressure and heart rate and have you pee in a cup and, you know, we'll call it good. Did you know you can say no to any of those? You know, so and and once you learn that, you're like, oh, OK, like maybe I don't want that uncomfortable vaginal exam. And is there a benefit to it at 26 weeks? Like, I don't know. What is that going to tell me? Same with at 39 weeks. You know, if you get the vaginal exam, it could give the doctor the opportunity to say, mm, this doesn't look good. You know, we're, you're not even close. Or, you know, things are moving and that's good. So it could be negative, positive. But does it do we need the information at all? Mm, I don't know. So so it goes with ultrasound. It would be kind of the same thing. So I know I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of my experience because I think sometimes that's helpful. I did not question it at all, especially with the first baby. And I remember thinking, is it necessary but it, since they all do it, it wasn't like I wasn't going to do it. I just had that thought come to me. Now, with the next baby, I was like, you know, it feels like maybe I don't need this. But again, here we are. And I've learned a little bit more. But I don't feel like it's that big of a deal. And so we did it again. And with my third, I was like, I'm not getting ultrasounds this time. And at about six weeks, <laughs> or eight weeks pregnant, Maybe I got it at 10 weeks. I can't remember, but I was like, I am starving. I am so hungry. I am. I just know that there's twins inside of me and I need somebody to tell me that there is not. And I knew they wanted an ultrasound anyway. So that was my way of, of saying, uh, I'm going to do this little thing that you're asking me to do. I really just need to know if there's two babies in there, which there weren't. So again, it really wouldn't have mattered if I saw in there or not, but that is what I chose to do. Uh, we did not get ultrasound at all past that point with my third baby. And that did mess with me a little bit because then you have to have, then you have to fight yourself on all of the things like, what if my baby does have Down syndrome or something like this um, and I don't catch it early? Knowing that ultrasounds can say that your baby has something and be totally wrong or say that your baby does not have something and be totally wrong. I was fully aware of that. It doesn't mean my mind didn't go to all the places saying, well, because you didn't get the ultrasound, now you're going to have all these issues. So hope you're ready for that. You know, those are the things that we battle all the time. Or I was I was going to miss some big thing that was really going to affect me or my baby. And it was going to be all my fault when it didn't go well, especially because I was planning a home birth. You know, those are the kind of like internal fights that we get to have with ourselves. And I did express some of that to my doula as I got closer to my laboring time um, in that third trimester. And she asked me a really like a lot of good questions um, just to help me think on if this is something that matters to me. Is it something that I feel like is important? Am I is there really a reason to be afraid or blaming myself for things? And that was really helpful. So, for example, if there was something like placenta previa where that 
placenta sits right over your cervix. So in a true previa, you cannot give birth vaginally. You would have to have a C-section. But how would they know if they didn't catch a placenta previa on like your 20-week scan? Well, there are other signs if, should you choose not to be scanned, such as bleeding before birth. Now, that can be really scary, and especially if you don't have an ultrasound letting you know that that's what is happening. But you would go into the hospital, and then they would order the ultrasound, and then they would see, okay, there is some bleeding. It's because of placenta previa. Let's see if this thing's going to move itself or, you know, whatever. It'd be the same if you had like a subchorionic hematoma or um, or other, or other things that you may not um, – that without ultrasound, you wouldn't know was there. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a negative outcome either way. It doesn't mean that your outcome is going to be more positive either way. It may and it may not. So again, ultrasounds are, they, they can be wonderful and positive and all the good things. They can also be stressful and negative depending on what the situation is. So it is something, I think it's just important that we all have an opportunity to decide for ourselves that this is something that we want. And I think because it's so routine, we haven't had an opportunity to do that. So that's kind of why I wanted to throw that at you guys. Now, let's talk about some benefits. So if we were going to like switch it back and forth and say benefits and risks, you know, benefits for mom is maybe an accurate first trimester dating. Maybe that is going to be really positive in some way. Does it does it necessarily matter that she gets dated in the first trimester, even if she doesn't know when her last period was or when she ovulates or when when her when anything, if she doesn't have that information, it doesn't necessarily matter. And at some point, you know, they're going to be going off of things like bundle height and all of that. However, if you are somebody whose cycles are really messed up and you are curious and there is some testing that you're concerned about needing to be at the right time. The, and or it offers peace of mind. Well, then guess what? You get to make that decision for yourself. Things like catching an ectopic pregnancy. Now, this is something that would be caught pretty early. It's unlikely that you're going to catch an ectopic pregnancy uh, as late as 12 weeks, but who knows? But that that's one of those things that you're like, I'm probably going to have other things telling me that something's going on. And then benefit is that you can go get an ultrasound and have that checked out. I know I had spotting with my first baby and when I had that spotting and I was really worried, I'm going to lose this baby or something's not right. It, um, it felt like a little scary to me, even though they're, you know, implantation bleeding or whatever. But I had spotting for a decent amount of time and it wasn't a lot, but it wasn't a little. Uh, and so they were able to do an ultrasound and show me my baby and we saw the heartbeat and I heard the heartbeat and it was really, really comforting. So there are reasons that moms choose to get it um, and there's reasons that you could not choose to get it. So, again, peace of mind could be one of them. And that could be in the event of trauma or you have a low kick count or whatever, just peace of mind. Maybe you've been in a car accident, you know, then that's it's like, great, we have ultrasound and we can everyone can feel better about that now. The risks, I would say the most common are probably the diagnostic errors, right? So inaccurately diagnosing your baby with a condition that ends up not being true. I've seen that happen where a mom has been told uh, because of this ultrasound, it looks like your baby is going to have Down syndrome or your baby is going to have these other, you know, issues. We found these abnormalities. And then that baby is born and they are totally fine. And so the entire time mom was planning and prepping and stressed and and she's like, wow, like I wish I wouldn't have done that. I could have saved myself so much stress, you know, not doing that. Now, hindsight's always twenty twenty, So I'll just say that. But I've also seen the other where it's like we've done the ultrasound, we've done the amniocentesis, we, you know, we did all of the tests that they said we needed to do and everything looks good and we're happy. And that baby does come out with some challenges. And that can be a hard pill to swallow, too, because you're like, wait, I just did some fairly risky things to make sure I was prepared in case these things existed and and I wasn't. However, there can be benefit to that, too. Like would if and this is where it is so personal, but I think some a way to look at it is if something were to be wrong with my baby, and I don't want to say wrong, if my baby were to have some kind of abnormality or some kind of challenge when they are born, and I didn't know about it ahead of time, or I did, would I do anything different? You know, I remember when we were overseas in Germany, my husband and I talk about this, and you know, they do these, they do the scans or they ask questions about, you know, 
would you want to keep your baby if, and my husband and I are like, yeah, like however they come, we'll deal with it. Of course, we're not looking to terminate or anything like that. But apparently there, and, and our doctor took like a big sigh of relief because apparently, and maybe it was just at that time or that hospital or that location, I'm not going to get into all that, but but in that area, whatever the case, it was like a lot of people terminated if they saw something on there that they didn't like. And that's scary because you can terminate babies that are going to be totally healthy. And, you know, obviously, I don't know if it's obvious and maybe that's not the norm, but it can happen. And even for a baby who's going to have some challenges, you know, um, there's there's other options. And anyway, so that, you know, different conversation for a different day. But but that can be the diagnostic errors can certainly be an issue. Now, another one that we see a lot is that inaccurate measurement of a baby, especially late term. So this is where maybe your fundal height seems bigger or smaller or whatever. And they're, they're like, you know, the baby's measuring really big. They're going to it's you're, you're going to have a nine, 10 pound baby. And so we don't want you to have that big of a baby. You know, we've got to deal with like shoulder dystocia or other scary things if your baby's going to be that big. So let's talk about induction. That's probably the most common one that we see or giving you a different due date based off of that. So instead of saying your baby's going to be big, it's like, oh, you're measuring at 40, whatever, 41 weeks, even though it says you're 39 right now. So then we probably should induce maybe our dates were off and we don't want the baby to get too big. And um, But saying that like your due date actually moved, that's like a huge one too. And we know ultrasounds are notoriously wrong, give or take a couple pounds. I just had, I just did a podcast with a mom where it was the opposite. Like it's usually like they say your baby's going to be so big. And this baby was measured, I think she said it was measured at eight pounds and she gave birth to an almost 10 pound baby. <laughs> I'm like, holy cow. And what a benefit that they measured wrong. Because And she's like, because I would have ended up having all these interventions or requesting induction or like telling me I needed a C-section all because of the, you know, how big my baby was. And she goes, and I birthed my baby just fine. So um, it's, you know, it just depends. And, and so I don't know. Ultrasounds can be tricky, but that's one of the risks. And then there's those deeper risks. And I don't know deeper as if I mean like more concerning as as much as I mean, like more subtle, like a little lower that we might not be seeing um, that, you know, it could take a couple generations or whatever to be able to see that. So I, I, like I said, I included that video for you guys in the show notes. It is old, but it is good and it's insightful. It's not perfect. I'm sure that there have been, there's, there's information that has come out since, but from what I've seen, and she, Dr. Carol Phillips, it's funny, this is actually on her YouTube channel. And um, I think I shared this at the beginning, but she, maybe I didn't. So the video is actually on Dr. Carol Phillips channel and she's wonderful. So it, where you, if, if you guys do the forward leaning inversion, that's who that came from. So we actually reached out and we created the course to her and said, Hey, can we use this? Cause it, it's so good. And we want to be able to use it within the course. And she said, absolutely. She was so sweet um, and gave us even extra information that we obviously included and gave her credit for within the course. But so this video was actually housed on her YouTube channel. And I thought it was so interesting because I couldn't find it. And I had to find it on her channel, whereas it used to be, again, readily available. So that was really great. But she even says there, like within her description, she's like, there haven't been any double blind studies. Like, do we really know the effects of ultrasound? No. And there are probably arguments either way as to why that has or hasn't been done, right? We could say money or um, availability or, or whatever, but the truth remains that the studies haven't been done. And so then it, it obviously leaves us as moms um, with some things that we need to decide for ourselves. But hopefully this episode was at least insightful in the way that it, it piques your interest and makes you curious about the different things that happen during pregnancy, even those things that seem routine. Uh, and, and makes you want to do a little bit more research to see what you feel comfortable with. You know, maybe you are like, I want the one ultrasound or I want the two ultrasounds and you know, which ones those are, but you can look at that and say, actually, you know, no matter what happens at this ultrasound or that ultrasound, I feel fine. And then you omit the others. It's totally up to you. And obviously if, if there is a reason for high risk kind of stuff where you need more ultrasounds or you have some other issue that necessitates an ultrasound, then we are grateful for the technology as always. Just like we are grateful for cesareans when they are useful. And no, I'm not putting the two of those next to each other. I'm just pointing out that there are different things that are offered and sometimes they are wonderful and sometimes they are overused and there are effects to either one. So with that, 
I'm going to finish up this episode here and I will see you all back here next week. If you guys have any questions or any information that you have, maybe you've seen some stuff, maybe you've seen some, some studies or you have information that has to do with ultrasounds, I would love to dive deeper into it. So feel free to send that to me. But again, questions, comments, anything, you can send those to hello at myessentialbirth.com or reach out to me at myessentialbirth on Instagram. Pretty active in all those places. But with that, I will see you next week. If you loved what you heard today, the very best way to support this podcast and help other moms to find it is to leave a quick review. I read one at the beginning of the episodes and I would love for yours to be next. And if you're ready for even more pregnancy, birth, and postpartum goodness, come join me in the My Essential Birth course at myessentialbirth.com where I will hold your hand and walk you through pregnancy and birth step-by-step so you're totally prepared for a birth you'll love. See you next week.